Okay, so um, a few housekeeping things. First thing, the recording, just so you know, because um, the idea is for, uh, for this to live on our YouTube channel. Mute, your, mute yourself when you're not speaking. And that's about it. So in three, two, one, we're starting. So welcome to um, Cinema for the Culture, our first online edition. My name is Mojisola Shunoiki, and I'm the founder of the African Film and Arts Foundation, producers of Cinema for the Culture. Um, today, we're pleased to have with us the cast, some of the cast and crew of the film Cook-Off. We have director Thomas Lutuli Brickhill. Um, we have the producer, Joe Njagu, and we have the lead actress, Tenda Ishe Chitima. Welcome all. The African Film and Arts Foundation is a 501 C3 nonprofit media arts organization. Our mission is to create a platform to promote, showcase, and support content that depicts Africa and its diaspora family in all its brilliance. We aim to be at the center of networking between the African content creators and American content creators, buyers, and distribution platforms. One of our main goals uh, at the foundation is to engage the younger generation of continental diaspora Africans in discussions around film production as they are the future storytellers. With that being said, two of our interns with the foundation, with my assistant, will be moderating the Q&A with our guest today. So before I hand over to um, the interns, we're going to play the trailer of the film so that you kind of get an idea and a little taste of what the film is about. Uh, the trailer is under two minutes, so we're going to play that now. I'm going to share my screen. And play the trailer. Can you all see it? I don't know. I think I missed my chance. Yes. Breakfast and fish. You go to school. Yeah, they dream. She's such a disappointment. So it's cooking again. How is uh his name is Tequila? Bye, love you. He's the only thing I managed to do right in this life. So, we're looking for 16 chefs to take part in the new season of Battle of the Chefs. You should enter, Mom. I, I really think you can do it. I'm a super professional chef. I wouldn't stand a chance. What is it? We've entered you into the cooking competition. What? Over the next 10 weeks, we'll be eliminating the weakest each week. Where are we going, Mom? Go big or go home. Are you ready for this? I'm going to kick your butt. I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm afraid you're not confident. You don't want to agree. Only professional chefs have ever made it past the second round. I hope there's nothing too experimental in this dish, because you know we like our salad the way we like it. I saw your honesty is now in the TV. I'm here on Battle of the Chefs to just show what single mothers are capable of. When am I going to meet this Prince Charming of yours? You know, like any other girl like me. You do your best. Believe in yourself. Good luck, Mom. Tapia really has his hopes up. I just feel like I'm way, way out of my depth. It's a good thing when people like you know their place. I didn't think you were a quitter. Maybe this was all a mistake. One last thing. I meant this too. And if it comes down to me versus you, I won't hold back. Hmm. Sounds like it's a little challenging there. <laughs> you gave us a piece of charcoal. On a plate masquerading as chicken. You're the weakest chef. Bye bye. I think that deserves an applause. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now I am going to hand you over to Blossom and Ayamide, interns uh, for the African Film and Arts Foundation. All right, I'll begin. Um, my name is Ayomide Takare. I am Nigerian American and I go to school at Barnard College in New York. 
Right now I'm currently in New Jersey and I am the graphic design intern for the African Film and Arts Foundation. Um, my interest in film basically lies in like allowing African narratives to be displayed to the world. So that's why I'm here. Um, thanks, Ayo. And then my name is Blossom Harofokwa. Um, I'm also Nigerian. Um, we will also both go to the same school, uh, Barnard College of Columbia University in New York City. Um, but I'm currently based in Lagos, Nigeria. And for the African Film and Arts Foundation, I am the um, social media content producer. Um, and my interest in like film and specifically African film is similar to I was just wanting to see um, African narratives like being represented like on the big screen by African people. Um, and also just so that other African people can see themselves being represented and like have that, um, that positive like image of themselves. Um, which is basically why we were interested in Cook Off because um, I actually only heard about the film this year. Um, and I only heard about it via Netflix because you know how everyone's watching Netflix now during quarantine. Um, but even though it came out um, years ago, um, so I was like on Netflix and I saw Cook Off and I saw it was a Zimbabwean film. I realized I had literally never seen a Zimbabwean film before. Um, and so um, I did some more investigation into it and saw that uh, Cook Off was the first Zimbabwean film on Netflix in general. Um, so I was like, okay, this sounds really, really interesting. So I told, um, Mujishola, our boss, and I was like, we should really cover this um, with like our account. And so we were like, we put it on our social media um, and well, you know, now we're here. <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah, thank you guys for joining. Um, so basically, I mean, obviously you guys just saw the trailer, but just in general to like go through this like general synopsis of Cook Off. Um, Cook Off is about a single mother um, named Anesu who lives with her son named Tapiwa. Um, and she's like an aspiring cook. She's a cooking talent, but she's not really, I mean, not that she's unable to tap into the potential, but um, she needs like more of an outlet for the potential. And basically Tapiwa, her son, motivates her to join a cooking competition. Um, and on the cooking competition, she's able to basically live out her dreams as a cook and then simultaneously find love. So it's like a really great, um, like really good, like feel good film. I was actually really satisfied after watching it. Um, so yeah. Yeah, as Blossom said, it was a really great film that we both enjoyed watching, but we weren't the only ones to enjoy watching the film. There's been a lot of buzz about the film and it's also been featured in countless film festivals, including Rotterdam, festivals in Rotterdam, Seattle, Durban, Nairobi, and the Pan-African Film Festival in Los Angeles. So with that being said, we'd like for everyone to introduce themselves. So Joe, um, you can do the honors, introducing yourself first. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I am John Jagu, uh, I'm a Zimbabwean filmmaker. I was the producer for Cook Off, the movie. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Tendaisha, over to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tendai Chitima, and I'm the lead actress in the film. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us. Of course. Thank you. And Thomas? Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Thomas Lutuli Brickhill. Uh, I'm a Zimbabwean filmmaker as well. Um, I'm the writer and director of Cook Off, and I also play the role of JJ in the film. Oh, wait, JJ. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting guy in that film. <laughs> um, okay. So on that note, we just wanted to ask, I guess, to begin, how did, like, I guess we can ask, I can ask this to Thomas specifically because you're the director, but, like, how did the concept of the film come about um, in general? Um, so I think uh, um, I... I, I really wanted to write a kind of um, like an adventure, a kind of feel good, you know, exciting film. Um, and with the lack of resources that we have uh, specifically in Zimbabwe, although I think that's it's quite a common kind of African problem that we have as filmmakers. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that I also kind of 
say often is that we have to think about what we can do with the resources that we do have. And so in the case of Cookoff, um, we had specific uh, access to the set of the TV show Battle of the Chefs. So it's a real life TV show um, and they are co-producers. They helped us to make the film by, by facilitating and giving us the set. Um, mm. So we had the costumes and the set and all the props and stuff that are used for the TV show. And that meant that then we could, you know, well, write a story around that. And obviously, you know, the, the, the story is about, is about people falling in love and, you know, and, and good friends and family and characters, as, as all good stories are. Yes. Um, but it helps, it helps to have a little something. So in our case, you know, the cooking competition is that little something. Mm -hmm. And I guess the story was really born out of the fact that we had access to that. And so that's what we decided to shape the story around. Okay. Okay, that's really. I mean, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's also just really resourceful to like use the things you have access to and then like shape stories around that. Um, so like, what process did you? I mean, I don't know if you were specifically the one who like looked for like the talents who would like make your film, but um, what processes like did you go through to like find Tendaiche as the lead actress and then Joe as the producer? Um, so it, it didn't actually happen in that order. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the, I mean, there were a couple of the other actors, uh, Prince, uh, Ten Diamond, who plays Prince. He was one of the first actors that we, the, well, that I had really, I, we'd already done a screen test with him. And I was very keen that, like, he could play this, you know, all around Prince Charming good guy that I was looking for in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, Charmaine, the best friend character. Um, who's, who's actually, I mean, like, she's an actress, she's a friend of mine. Uh, that's, uh, like, I never even bothered to change her name, you know. I'd written the script <laughs> with that role in mind. And so her character was called Charmaine because it was, you know, a role that Charmaine was supposed to play. But, but really, you know, I had a few of the characters cast. Um, I'd kind of done as much of the producing as I could do. Uh, getting to the point where it was now like getting really close in time to when we needed to start filming. Um, and we didn't yet have a lead actress. Uh, that was one of the major issues that I hadn't managed to sort out. And at this point, uh, Joe had been away for a while and he came back and we had a meeting and I pitched him this idea that, look, dude, I need you to help me make this film. Um, and Joe, he's a writer-director, you know, in his own right. He's made a lot of uh, good films. But as, as I said to him at the time, I need you to do something else for me. I need you to produce because I don't have a producer and I know that you can help me make this film. Um, and so, yeah, so Joe actually came on board um, and it was him. It was him that led us to, to Tenda Isha. I should let him tell that story. Yes, please do. Yeah, yeah. So, Tendaiche coming on board. <laughs> so, uh, I had I'd, I'd done uh, a film uh, called Escape, uh, where Tendaiche had, had, had come uh, for the auditions. That's actually the first time I saw Tendaiche, and <laughs> and after that, Tendai Tendai had been in touch, you know, like on Facebook. Like she's like, hey, is anything happening? Every time she's just she's just been like messaging me. If there's anything happening, please let me know. Please let me know. You know, and uh, Tom and I, from 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 the first draft of Cook Off, Tom had been sending me the first from the drafts to read, and I was not on board uh, as producer yet. But like you were just consulting, like to say, okay, I have this script. Can you read it? Tell me what you think. So I was I was pretty much there, like from when when Tom started writing the the script. And so I already knew like the script, the story, the different drafts as we, as we progressed. And then coincidentally, right? Uh, uh, so when I was reading the script, I kept trying to think, you know, like obviously as a director, you try to visualize something like who could be, who, are the, who could play this, right? And then uh, I'd seen Tendi audition for, for something that we had done. And she, she didn't have a part for that film, that particular film we we're doing, but I could tell like, mm, she's talented, she's got, she, 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 she can act. And she actually messaged me uh, 
a, the same day I was reading, like, I think it was like draft four or five of Cook Off. And she messaged me like, hey, what's up? Long time. <laughs> Checking out. Is there anything happening? Uh, I'm going to be in Zimbabwe. Because uh, Tendi is based in South Africa. She's a Zimbabwean, but she's based in South Africa. So she's like, I'm going to be in Zimbabwe for a couple of months. Is there anything else happening? And here I was reading this story and I'm like, hmm, Tendi could actually pull this off, you know? Uh, and I wasn't part of that, of the of cook of yet. And all I could do was like, so I, I messaged them and said, okay, there's this project that's happening that my friend is doing, Tom, right? And I could recommend you to try for, for lead, for the lead role. Uh, she's like, yeah, 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 please. Uh, so I said, okay, before I send you the script, let me speak to the director first. So I spoke to Tom and Tom, I remember Tom was like, uh, who's she? So, so, so Tendi, in her own right, Tendi has done quite a lot uh, as, a, as a performer uh, in South Africa. She's been in like big TV series that are on DSTV. So I remember saying to Tom that uh, she's appeared on Isi Dingo, she's appeared on this. And then I remember Tom saying, ah, dude, but you know, I'm trying to run this on a no budget. I don't think <laughs> I can afford <laughs> <laughs> and and I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Try out if 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 she can work, like she's she's good people, she's willing to work, she's coming down. And it was almost like magic. And I remember sending Tom clips, like YouTube links of Tendi's work of what she had done before, because he didn't he didn't know who she was. And then he was like, Okay, set it up. So I sent Tendi the script. She read the script, she's like, Oh my god, I love it. And I'm like, okay, I'll introduce you to the director. Then I introduced her to Tom. And, and I wasn't even part of the project then. Like I was, I was just talking with Tom uh, about the project and that's how Tendi got onto the project. Yeah. Wow, that's a really nice, like, a story. <laughs> yeah, really nice story. Um, Tendaisha, we'd like to ask um, how working together was like after being a part of the project and like just the whole process of that and how how it was to work with everyone on, in the casting crew. Thank you for asking. Um, well, this was actually my first feature film. So I was so happy. Um, like Joe said, I was very hungry for work um, and I really wanted to, to act in a film. Um, interestingly, people had said to me that there was nothing in Zimbabwe. So for me to find um, a team that was actually working on a very good script and for me to be lead on the film was such an exciting adventure for me. I literally, I, I, thought, I thought to myself, this was a perfect chance for me to apply everything I'd learned to school, um, finally, you know? <laughs> so I was super excited and I, um, I, I was happy to be working with some amazing Zimbabwean actors that I had grown up watching on TV, some legendary actors and um, like I said, it was my first feature film. So just being on set and seeing all the pieces come together, um, especially, I think it was even more special because it was a Zimbabwean film. I had been in South Africa for a while. So my first feature film being in Zimbabwe meant so much to me because I was telling a story of my own people. And the story resonated with me. Um, you know, someone pursuing their dreams, overcoming so many challenges. And so... I was just really excited. Like every day for me was a, a, a good challenge. Um, I was applying myself um, every single day. I was on set, I think every day, if not all the day, I don't know, most of the days. Um, because as lead character, you basically like in almost every scene. Um, but the cast was amazing, like I said. And then the crew, it was amazing because some people were also, it was their first time as well. So it was Thomas's first directing um, role. And then uh, I know the, the cinematographer, it was his first time as well doing a, a feature film. And the makeup, no, not the makeup, the wardrobe lady, one of my friends, she was also, it was the first time doing a film. Um, the AD was also his first time doing a feature film. So I think everybody was just fresh and uh, ready to, to do the work. And um, everyone was so dedicated to the project. Um, because it was so exciting. The script was really well written and um, kudos to, to Thomas for, for pulling it together because I think to, for me personally, I feel like the essence of 
of film or of storytelling really lies in, in the actual writing. So if you write a really good script, then um, I think like more than half of the work is, is done. Um, so yeah, it was great. I really enjoyed it. Um, like I said, I, although there were, I, there were challenges here and there in terms of like just the economic crisis that's in Zimbabwe at the moment. Um, and just, you know, it wasn't like a luxury. I always say it wasn't a luxury set. You know, if you can imagine like Hollywood films with like trailers, ah, zipping yeah. on someone and like getting, <laughs> getting all your, you know, you can say, oh, please, can I have some grapes? I mean, you can, you can try and say whatever you want. Um, it wasn't like that. But for me, it was, like I said, such a special film for me. And the fact that it's now on Netflix is such a testament to God's grace and just the fact that nothing is impossible. And that if you, if you just literally, it was a lesson for me as well, like just kind of looking for opportunities and um, it pays off. It, it's rewarding to, to try and, and, and seek out opportunities for yourself and not just wait for people to, to give you opportunities. So I think the experience altogether was really, really uh, an amazing experience. And then all the way to now where it's on Netflix, I mean, you can imagine the excitement that I have. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's a really beautiful experience. And it's also a really inspiring story too. Um, I want to ask you, um, how do you think that you're like, because you did say that this was your first like feature film. So how do you think that your um, past experience like, trained you and prepared you for this film? Well, definitely. Um, so I, 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 I went to school for film, media and drama um, in Cape Town at the University of Cape Town. And um, I took drama classes for three years. And so the training itself was preparation because, you know, they teach you how to um, analyze character, how to analyze a script. They teach you um, like uh, story arcs and like how the character is supposed to move. I mean, basically they teach you all the things that you need to know as an actor. Um, and like I said, I was dying to actually just kind of apply all that stuff. So definitely the training was, was um, preparation. And then also I think the, I would say the TV shows I was on here in South Africa were, were definitely very good practice mm -hmm. on just set etiquette, um, taking direction from a director, um, just, you know, like w working with others, collaboration, um, seeing things through in terms of uh, TV work or, or just storytelling in general, like on camera, because um, it's different. I studied drama mm -hmm. as in theater and then actually translating that onto uh, I mean, moving from theater to, to camera work is very different in some ways. So just that practice, I think, played a huge role. So the training itself and then the practice I'd had in South Africa um, on TV and some short films I'd done definitely were very good practice. And then I, I'll just say life experiences as well. Um, <laughs> there's so many things, like I said, that I could relate with Anisu. Um, like just kind of, yeah, going for your dreams and just, working hard um those are things i think most of us have experienced and can relate to so and family dynamics um all those things are preparation for for the role wow okay um thank you for that um i just wanted to ask i mean someone had just put it in the chat but i'm just like now um like curious because the night you just talked about how like getting like put on Netflix to you guys was um, just a testament to like how much like work had been put into the film and like how like good, like just basically how good of like a product it was. So I guess this is, might be a question for Thompson as, as the director, but if any of you guys have insight, you can also add. Um, but how did exactly did the film get on Netflix? Like what was the process for that? Um. So we, um, obviously, I mean, you know, uh, in this day and age, I think it's something that filmmakers kind of strive. It's, it's kind of like a, a benchmark of, of quality or something that, you know, if your film is on Netflix or, or any of these, you know, major international platforms, then, you know, okay, people now can take you seriously that, you know, you make real films. This is, this is like a, a proper thing. Mm -hmm. so, so it's definitely something that we were interested in uh, from the beginning, but I don't think, you know, realistically we didn't know how to go about that. 
Um, it's not something that, you know, you can just kind of, uh, I don't know, call or, or, or find an email address and say, hey, this is my film and send it to them. And then they go, oh, cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, these things happen through, through agents, through distributors. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we, we ended up with a South African distributor um, mm -hmm. and they're the people who presented the film um, to Netflix. They, they knew that Netflix was looking for more African content at the moment and they felt that Cookoff mm -hmm. was a good fit um, for that. But I think like, you know, we'd also put in a lot more work into the film. So w the original film, uh, somebody mentioned, I think at the, at the beginning, I don't know if it was you, Blossom, that like the, 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 the film had been like out for a while or whatever. Mm -hmm. But actually, no, this, it's like when it got released onto Netflix, that was the release of Cookoff. So prior to that, um, it had gone around to a bunch of festivals. And mm -hmm. so we had like our kind of international festival premiere and our African premiere in Durban and, you know, a few of the different film festivals. Um, and during that time, we were still reworking the final product. So mm -hmm. we edited it down. The first version that we showed at the very first festival was about 15 minutes longer than the film that you see now. So we kind of trimmed it down because we felt it was a bit too long. We managed to get the sound redone. We had to redo parts of the soundtrack. Um, we also had the film regraded um, to, to, you know, tweak the picture quality. Um, and so all this, all this extra work had gone in uh, from the time that we first met the distributor, um, mm -hmm. who actually we met in Durban at the film festival there. Um, because, you know, thankfully in Zimbabwe, we, were like, we couldn't go to most of the film festivals because, you know, it was a low budget film to start off with. And then we didn't have like a, a festival budget to be flying all around the world and, you know, going attending festivals. So it was very few festivals that we could go to. But thankfully, because Durban is in our neighboring South Africa, that wasn't too, too much of a stretch. Uh, mm -hmm. So me and Tendi both attended uh, Durban Film Festival. And that's where we met for the first time um, the guys who would ultimately become mm -hmm. our distributor. But, you know, at that point, they weren't that excited about the film. I guess it was still a bit rough around the edges, even if we were getting into some festivals, um, you know, but later the final polished version of the film, that's the version that now made it onto Netflix. Mm -hmm. So I think all of those things play a part, you know, mm -hmm. there's not like one thing I could say like, oh yeah, that's what did it. That's how we got there. I think it's all that work over time, which really, which, you know, mm -hmm. led to the final result. Okay, that's a really good explanation of the progression there. That actually makes sense to me. Um, when we were like, I mean, watching the film and like looking at all the, like, the praise the film has gotten and all the, um, like, noise about the film in the media, um, and also just us here, like, referring to it as, um, a film like the first Zimbabwe Netflix film obviously it's like such a big um just just such a big accomplishment and achievement but what do you guys think about um kind of like the political aspect of that in the way that like the like things seem to have more validation if they're validated by something like Netflix as opposed to like the validation you guys received in film festivals on the continent so I don't know if that's like that clear of a question but like what do you think about like the politics of like reception and like how things are more valued maybe if they have like the validation from like Netflix and um, organizations like that? Um, well, I don't know. Look, my, my personal take on it, what I see from a Zimbabwean perspective mm -hmm. is that that's, that's still very prevalent. I mm -hmm. think we, we kind of, uh, even with the, the bands, like if we have, you know, um, musicians, there's a, a, a musician very recently called Shasha, who, who got a BET award. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, again, it was like this momentous thing. Um, but like lots of people in Zimbabwe were surprised, like, oh, who's Shasha? We've never heard of Shasha, right? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, like, I mean, I, I knew her because I, I've kind of been involved in the music scene. But she was around like, you know, four or five years ago. And she's been around for a long time. But people don't really take notice of you, like locally at home, 
they kind of expect you to achieve something outside of the borders mm -hmm. and then suddenly it's a big deal then then you know and i think we do we do have that as as an issue generally that it's like um you know yeah it should have it should have already been exciting for people that we were um you know at durban film festival it's the biggest film festival in africa it's it is actually a big deal to get a film there i think we were the first zimbabwean film there for about 10 years um uh, like you know so th th you know there are big things that happen but but then like because it's like oh it's just south africa you know zimbabweans don't really like maybe pay that much attention to it in the same way as now you know when we've been to the pan african festival in la and like oh wow okay now that's a big deal now people mm -hmm. you know recognize it as you've gone you know overseas it's like <laughs> that that stamp of recognition and so netflix kind of brought that same thing that suddenly there was like you know a renewed interest a renewed mm. interest in the film yeah I, I agree it's it's an issue that we have to look at because i don't think we see enough um like pan african film film across the continent you know mm -hmm. like Zim, I know because like with when you when you have a film that's going to festivals you start paying attention so like I know that we've been in the same film festival as like uh, Supermodo this Kenyan film um, the, the Burial of Kojo um, what was the others oh, Five Fingers for Marseille it's a South African film there's like so much interesting African cinema across the continent not just you know I mean, obviously, South Africa and Nigeria have the most stuff going on, but actually all over there's interesting films. But generally, we don't hear about each other's stuff. We don't hear yeah. about each other's work. And we need to change that, definitely. Exactly. That, yeah, that's such a good commentary. Because I know Nigeria, like, if someone reaches, like, the West, like, the language is, oh, we've blown, or, like, whatever, or, like, Nigeria to the world, or whatever. But um, even though we were already, like, doing our stuff, like, nationally um, and also continentally. So that's, that's a very good thing to bring up. Um, since you mentioned music and Shasha, I mean, I don't know that, yeah, I didn't mention music and Shasha, I just made me think about the soundtrack. So I was just wondering, was your soundtrack um, all original or were there songs you guys pulled from um, pre-existing music? Um, so so it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, basically the, the it's all zimbabwean artists that we used in the soundtrack um but we kind of like tried to have a very eclectic mix of music because again there's this kind of uh, misconception that like african music is all the same it's all the some like generic afro pop which it exists right and it's very popular but it's not like it's not like we all have like one genre of music across the entire continent which a Hollywood kind of African movie would make you believe like there's, you know what I mean? It's the same. It doesn't matter whether it's set in South Africa or Congo or whatever. It's like the same Afro soundtrack that they put. So mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I was definitely keen to have something, you know, more, more varied and show that like we have more to offer. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like a bunch of established uh, artists um ten uh, who plays who plays prince in the film he's he's a rapper so he a couple of his tracks are on the soundtrack um my, i actually i play in a, in a band as well um so a couple of my band's songs are on the soundtrack um mm -hmm. and then uh, shingai shoniwa who i don't know if she's how big a star she is like if people know her but she so she's the one who kind of appears to tapiwa um when he's like having his like crisis and doesn't know what to do and she kind of comes and says you know everything will be okay in the end like mm -hmm. yeah so she's a, she's a really big rock star in the uk she's like a zimbabwean um singer who played so, so the song that we used in the film is from a band called the noisettes um which she was part of now she's also doing like at the, at the moment she's got a solo um album which i think is just coming out or it's about to come out um but yeah so there was kind of all of that existing music and then we also had a guy called ryan korea 
um, a Zimbabwean guy who's now living in, uh, in Ibiza. And so he, I know him from school um, and I knew him as a composer. And so we work together now on the original score. So there's mm -hmm. also score music as well mm -hmm. as the so kind of soundtrack songs. And then all of that comes together to make the full soundtrack. Okay, I'm gonna have to look those up after. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And thank you for making sure to have like different genres of African music because it is true that a lot of people just see African music as like one genre when it really is more than African music. Um, with that, I'd like to ask Joan Jagu um, what like the challenges were that you guys encountered like during the making of this film and how like overcoming that was? Okay, uh, challenges, challenges, <laughs> crazy. So, so, so to begin with, uh, from the get go, uh, me and Thomas knew that the, we didn't have a budget. There was no money. <laughs> uh, we had, uh, I'm sure you guys have seen, like was like in terms of cash, of cash in hand with like eight grand eight thousand dollars only right to pull this off right uh and me and thomas like acknowledged the fact that this was crazy like we we're about to jump onto something that's insane like i remember <laughs> i remember the day we like we we call it the handshake hashtag the handshake where me and him we shook on it and said okay dude and <laughs> he gave me like a bank card <laughs> uh with with all the money we had right the eight grand and we shook on it and i remember we we were at the studio where we where we shot the film where the battle of the chefs where the cooking happens right and we got into the car it was me tom and my little brother who plays the the, the baby daddy to anesu to the lead character uh it was the three of us and we got in the car and the distance from the studio to Thomas to Thomas's house is like a 15 20 minute drive and i remember after shaking on it we drove from the studio to Tom's house without saying a word like in my head i was like okay what am i getting myself into here <laughs> like like i knew i knew i knew what it takes and i'm like okay how are we going to pull this off with 8 grand and tom i don't know what he was thinking <laughs> we didn't even say a word until we got to Tom's house and I dropped him off. He's like, okay, dude. And we were starting to shoot on, on Monday. <laughs> like, okay, cool. So let's speak on the phone and then let's catch up. Let's see how it's going to go. And I remember driving home and thinking, okay, wow, this is not going to cut it. So, so in terms of challenges, uh, we, we sort of knew what we were diving into. So there were no surprises in terms of financial because we knew what we had. Uh, uh, the, 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 the challenges that I could say were crazy were those that cropped up and we didn't plan for them. Like one crazy one was uh, we discovered that there was a thief. There was someone who was stealing stuff uh, during the production, right? And I remember uh, even Tendi's phone was stolen, Tendi's iPad was stolen, you know, some of the gear was stolen, the makeup kit was stolen, the costumes were stolen, you know? And this was like a crazy challenge that we, we never anticipated, right? Because we were shooting at this studio, at this warehouse. And so we would leave this, the warehouse like in the wee hours of the morning and then come back the next day. And then you get the makeup artist coming to me and saying, I'm missing some of my makeup kit. And the costumes person is coming and saying, I'm missing some of the costumes. And I'm like, what do you mean you're missing some of the costumes? We left here at three in the morning and we're back at six in the, at six a.m. So what? Do you, who stole them? Who stole this stuff, right? And that was crazy. That was like one of the craziest things that happened during the shoot. And uh, we had to play detective. Like I remember uh, taking Tom to the side and me and him just talking and saying, "Okay, dude, what is going on here?" And then we're put in a position where we're starting to think maybe is it so? If there's a thief, it means it's one of us. It's, it's, it's part of the cast and the crew, right? <laughs> and we have to fish this thief out. Like, how do we do this, right? Without offending people. Because 
we are working on a project where we have no budget. Everyone is believing in the project. People are working on a deferred payment system. How do we work on this, right? Uh, that was one of the craziest, hardest things we had to overcome. And I remember uh, me and Tom saying, you know what? Uh, let's bite the bullet. Uh, if this is happening, if it's one of us, let's just see what we can do. And we stopped the shoot and we had to, say, we had to address this to everybody and say, okay, this is what, just, what has just happened. We're missing gear, we're missing clothes, we're missing makeup. The lead actress, Tendi, she can't find a phone, she can't find the iPad. And, and was trip searching everybody on set, the cast and the crew. It was crazy. And finding out, okay, uh, we didn't find anything. And then, but the, the still, the show must go on because we have limited time with the studio where we were shooting. Because in two weeks, the studio had to be taken apart, right? Uh, so I'm saying to Tom, okay, Tom, uh, can you just stay in your creative zone as hard as it is? You know, and Tendi, please, I know your phone is missing, your iPad is gone, but let's just try and keep the show going on. And I'm gonna try and see what's going on, you know, and you're put in this position where you have to play detective, you know, and <laughs> uh, we played detective and, found, and, and luckily, fortunately, we managed to, re to recover every, all that stuff. Like we discovered that one of the guards at the, at the studio, at the warehouse, was the was the thief who was stealing stuff from us you know <laughs> it's crazy you know <laughs> so so that's that's like one of the craziest things we went through shooting and making cook off you know uh and adding on to that like we made the film during a time when the 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 political uh standing of the country was crazy this was the time when people were sick and tired of robert mugabe and there were riots and everything. So there were moments where you would have actors uh, getting mixed up in a riot, uh, tear be getting tear gassed, and they can't come to set. They have to go back home. So, but 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 for that, like I, I always like to say that if anyone, if if Kuko was made by anyone who was in Zimbabwe at the time, they would have given up. They'd be like, you know what? Stop the shoot. Let's let's stop this. Let's not continue. But the, the advantage we had is that uh, me and Tom were like hardcore Zimbabweans. Like we've gone through this. We know we've been through the. So these were problems that we kind of anticipated and, be, and we were like, oh, you know what, dude, no matter what, let's just gear up and go. So yeah, those are some of the challenges that we faced making cook off. Just wanted to say, Bola said in the chat that the story of the making of the film should be a film. And I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay. I'm done. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. That, I was not expecting that to be a challenge at all. I can't believe that happened. And I'm glad that everyone got like everything back because, wow, that's a lot. Um, Joe, you mentioned um, like the politics that were happening during like the making of the film. And I guess I wanted to ask Tendaisha, but like, what would you, okay, basically the, there's like the Zimbabwean Lives Matter hashtag that's trending now. And there's been a lot of talk about like what's been happening in the country. So um, I just wanted to ask about like your thoughts on that and like, basically what like your thoughts on what's been going on and how that affects the you like you and your role as an actress thank you for um bringing that up actually it's a very important um i think movement for zimbabweans um at the moment especially young people in the country um it's interesting when you're outside of the country um, a lot of people who move to the, the diaspora will tell you that um, they wish they could go back home. And then the irony of it is the people back home, um, recently I discovered that a lot of young people were saying on Twitter that their dream, their one dream is to leave the country. And for me, that was heartbreaking 
because I mean, as a young person, you'd expect some kind of dreams like, um, oh, I want to be an astronaut, or I want to be a physician in this science or in this um, fields in medicine, or you know, it's big dreams like dreams that can impact the world, dreams that can make a difference. But at the moment, literally, like the youth of Zimbabwe just want to leave the country. They don't even want to be there. And I mean, there's so many challenges that we've been facing as young people um, in terms of just dreaming and seeing your life progress and making progress. And, you know, you'd be surprised the simplest of things are not available in Zimbabwe. Um, just from the basics, running water, electricity um, is a problem. Um, and obviously with the situation I described with diaspora, it means that families have been dispersed around the world. And so some kids are growing up, um, they're taking care of themselves or they're taking care of their siblings. Their moms and dads are all over the world trying to make a living and sending money back home. Um, so there's, there've been so many complexities with, um, with being Zimbabwean and being in such a um, unrelated, unrelenting economic crisis because it's been happening for like 20 years now um is it 20 years yeah 20 years <laughs> uh so like like yeah it's it all started around 2000 but anyway um also like just I, one thing also just to mention that uh, i saw on twitter in this movement was a young man saying that he's never used an atm and he's 24 years old that broke my heart as well i mean there's so many little things that we take for granted um um, or other people you know around the world will take for granted and you realize that um, you know for some people in this in this world literally when they wake up all they're thinking about is survival and I mean I've had the privilege of traveling around the world and one thing that I've realized is definitely that people my age around the world in other parts of the world definitely don't wake up thinking is there going to be water today or is there going to be electricity where, where am i going to find fuel and for me um this movement i think means that there's an awakening amongst young people to say we we be demanding better and we want better for ourselves and also for the country um the healthcare system is in shambles um there's so many problems but you know as young people if we can have our voices heard in a non-violent way in a way that um the world can also see what's happening and because sometimes there's a lot of fear and people don't speak out but if we can gather our strength and just be able to make the world know what's happening maybe we can hold our leaders accountable and we can see change um but it's a very important movement and it's very close to my heart because like you said it's affected me um in a whole lot of ways my family moved to south africa because of that um and also just still being a Zimbabwean citizen, um, you know, I know I can't go back home and try to be um, a full-time actress yet because our industry is still growing because of the economy. It's been in shambles. So, um, you know, it's limited me in so many ways. But again, that's why the film going on to Netflix is such a step in the right direction because then we know that nothing is impossible. Just by the way things are, literally nothing is impossible and hopefully uh we continue to to get partners who um allow um our industry to grow and to distribute beautiful stories about our people uh, regardless of what we've been facing as a nation huh. that's like there's a lot there i mean yeah. i i'm really glad that like it's very heartbreaking but i'm really glad about like at least since everyone has to be away from each other, I'm just glad about the power of like things like social media in like uniting people across different places, but also like granting awareness to people outside because I feel like so often like things happen on the continent and nobody cares. But I just think like thing after thing has been taking place during this time. So it's kind of just like the world can't ignore things that are going on anymore. So we pray, we really pray, but um, yeah, big up to all the like the young people like standing up for themselves because it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Um, and I also you also mentioned like the film industry and how like I can also imagine like having like a negative like economic like um, environment would be really detrimental towards like having a flourishing film industry. Um, so that 
that is a lot. That's, there's a lot of things there. But um, how did, did that like affect like the type of equipment you guys were able to get? Like what types of like, well, I mean, just like in terms of like a technic, like, like technologically speaking, like what kind of cameras were you guys able to use? Um, like what kind of like technological equipment were you guys able to use? And Thomas can ask this as the director. <laughs> um yeah i mean yeah that it's it's definitely limiting i mean obviously with uh, i think with digital technology across the world there's been a kind of a democratizing of like filmmaking mm -hmm. in the way that you know generally costs have gone down from what we would consider if we're talking about trying to shoot on like you know 35 millimeter film and getting a film camera and paying for developing certainly mm -hmm. from that perspective you know things have gone down but by the same token the digital technology is like constantly moving and constantly mm -hmm. improving and in our case certainly you know yeah our, our budget lim limitations meant that we couldn't you know think too much about getting the latest gear that wasn't that wasn't a possibility um we were lucky that we had a co-production partner who's uh, uh, a, an equipment rental facility in Harare um, that you know hires out uh, camera gear and lights and sound equipment. Um, you know, but but even then, it's like uh, like they they are very limited. It's not like they have the latest stuff. They basically have like secondhand equipment that's come from another higher facility, uh, I think in Europe that they're partnered with and they kind of get the hand-me-downs, you know, like the stuff that's no longer useful in Europe now comes to Africa and then we using that. So, so I think like, yes, that was almost like another hurdle that we had to like look at in terms of, I know from, from you know, what, the, what myself and Sebastian, who was the, the DOP um, had in mind visually for the story like in terms of the storyboards and the shot selections and the camera movements that we had wanted to do when we'd been planning because we'd been planning this shoot for you know for probably a full year like leading up to actually shooting it but then a lot of the stuff within the last two weeks we had to you know rapidly like change our plans really drastically because we suddenly realized like we couldn't actually move the camera hardly at all because we didn't have equipment that we needed to make those movements look smooth and look professional. And we didn't want like a shaky handheld, you know, uh, uh, camera thing. We wanted something slick and professional looking, but we couldn't afford that. So that wasn't, you know, that wasn't an option. And I think obviously if you're, if you're making a low budget film, but in a, country where there's a thriving film industry then there's going to be lots of opportunities to uh to like make deals to leverage to get equipment to get you know there are people who own their own gear who own like nice stuff who maybe you can try and get onto your project there's kind of layers of like in a working film industry there's there's like layers of of i don't know not, not a safety net as exactly but like you know that that facilitate and help emerging filmmakers to make something whereas in our case certainly the fact that that didn't exist was a challenge and then on top of that you know something that me and joe have been dealing with from the time that we made the film up until now and it's still a challenge is trying to sell the film right because like when when we were when we were kind of maybe uh, just before we were shooting it, uh, when we were about to shoot the film, actually when Joe was shooting his previous feature, because uh, we'd been friends and we'd been talking about these kind of issues for a while, we had ideas about like okay, at that point in time in Zimbabwe, there was like a kind of I would say a healthy DVD market that you know you could reasonably think of like selling a film on DVD, um, but still, you know, you had to do it like in a bang because you have to like outpace the pirates and quickly sell all your DVDs before, you know, too many pirate copies get onto the streets. So we were kind of thinking in those terms. And in the meantime, 
like whilst we made the film and stuff, the way that the economy keeps moving in Zimbabwe has meant that even the idea of buying a bulk load of DVDs has been like a challenge. Like we can't, you know, work out how do you import that quantity of DVDs because of the access to the foreign currency, which is a problem. Um, and then how do you deal with marketing a product that now, you know, when people are at a level where, you know, getting bread is a problem, how do you try and convince somebody to buy a movie? You know, when like the basic, basic, like living is the challenge. How, like film entertainment becomes a luxury thing, you know, and not something that, that people can necessarily look at. So, you know, um, yeah, like the, all of those things have, have continued to make, to make, you know, more challenges, I would say, to, to our attempts to, you know, to help, uh, I think, you know, yeah, me and Joe have often mentioned that like there's not a film industry in Zimbabwe. There's like an enthusiastic film community. Mm -hmm. We want to build it into a film industry. That's our dream, you mm -hmm. know, to build a film industry in the country. And, mm -hmm. and like it seems like more challenges keep, keep landing on top of, of the existing challenges as, mm -hmm. as, we, as we try. Um, not that we're going to stop trying, but it is yeah it's hectic mm -hmm. it's hard but i i genuinely believe in my chest like we shall overcome on the continent yeah. like i really i really believe it um so just like on that topic in general that's a great just like wrap up um what do you guys think and i guess any of you three or all of you three can answer since in different ways we've been talking about it but what do you guys think is the future of african cinema um, and you guys can respond from the Zimbabwean level or the continental level or even the global level. But yeah, what do you think Africans, yeah, what are the, what's the future of African cinema? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off seeing as I was, okay. I was already talking and then, and then Joe and Tendi, you can put your, uh, <laughs> your, your ideas and your versions. Um, for me, I think, um, the future of, of African cinema. Um, I think, you know, we are united by one singular issue, which I see in, in the films. And it's something that we were very much trying to address with Cook Off. And that's that the generally, specifically the narrative that Hollywood wants to tell about Africa. But even when we make our own films, sometimes we fall into the same trap. And that's that, all the stories focus on negative aspects. So we have, you know, stories about like genocide or stories about poverty or stories about illness or hunger or, and, and you know, I think like it's, it's, those things exist. They are part of the continent. They are part of the challenges that we face. That's not that we should sugarcoat things, but that's not the some total of who we are. And we have to tell stories about the good stuff as well. So with Cook Off, we wanted to, you know, show that like, I guess in, in, in that way, like for us, with everything that's been going on in Zim, I feel it like even more now that our Cook Off was our act of defiance, right? That we still, we still are entitled to happiness. We are still entitled to be able to fall in love to eat good food, right? And, and for us as storytellers, that's the way that we add to the conversation is we show the possibilities of, you know, this is, this is the life that we want to be living in Zim. It's not like all rose tinted, we're still struggling, but that's what we wanted to present on film. And I think that's the future where we go. That's, that's my, my two cents. I'll just add on that actually. Um... I am so fascinated by African futurism, if any of you know it. And um, it's like, yeah, for me, that's where we're, we're supposed to be going. Like that imagery, like what Tom is saying of not just who we've been in the past or the challenges that we're facing now, but dreaming of a, of a bigger and better future for Africans. Um, I mean, so many um, 
we've got so many opportunities, I think, to create worlds and, um, and possibilities through the art that we make. And um, I feel like something like Afrofuturism, I think, plays a, a role in us imagining beyond what we already are. And it takes along things like technology and storytelling and kind of puts it together. In a way, for me, that's very fascinating because when you think of Africa right now, I mean, large numbers of the population don't even have access to technology or to, or to access to the internet and things like that. But just kind of playing with sci-fi, playing with technology, playing with all those elements, I think will begin to help us to shape mindsets that think beyond where we are right now. And um, so for me, I want to see more sci-fi. I want to see more um, fiction and more uh, just exploration on our own creativity as Africans and how, for, how far we can push it. Um, now that we, we have those means and tools and there's definitely, I believe, a growing audience, not just in Africa, but a hunger from all parts of the world for African content. And so that's very positive. Um, and if we can just push those boundaries of, of our creativity and show that we, we can think outside the box. Yes, we can also go to space um, <laughs> or something like that. You know, like just thinking outside the box really uh, that we've been placed in so far. I think that's where African cinema is going. It's going to a place where there's no limits. There are no limits. And it's just boundary, boundaryless um, storytelling. That's where I want to see African cinema go. Yeah, and, and I, I think I'll, I'll just add on to what, what Tom and Tendi uh, are saying. Uh, for me, uh, in terms of what I would like to call the world film conversation, we, we're living in a time where uh, Hollywood, like, were like the, the, the big in the industry. Uh, I, I like to say they're, they're running out of stories to tell and they're sort of like inclining towards uh, Africa. That Africa is almost like a big part of these untold stories. But the beauty of that is that we are in the age of technology where we're also capable of telling our own stories. Uh, uh, I like to give the example of Kukov, like, like in a very positive way where I remember seeing tweets about Kukov, about people like these guys. I remember seeing this tweet from this guy from like Texas or something. And he was like, oh, it's so amazing. Uh, I was surprised to see that people in Zimbabwe can smile. I was surprised to see that people in Zimbabwe know someone, meet and people. So, so for them, it's changing that perception uh, of Africa. And I remember there was this one guy who inboxed me uh, about Kukov, right? Uh, and he's like, oh, it's so amazing how like, uh, is Zimbabwe really like that? People, I, we, I thought that people in Zimbabwe were just under oppression and every day they're suffering under the dictatorship and whatnot. And film has that power to change those kind of perceptions. Like, uh, we face the disadvantage of, of, of platforms like CNN, BBC, and that push a certain narratives when it comes to Africa. Like, if it's just Zimbabwe, like, I think Zimbabwe was made famous by Robert Mugabe for being this big di dictator that just, like, <laughs> t taking everybody down. But when, 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 when you look at it, like, there's more to that than, like, to the politics. There's, we're, we're, we, like, I, li I like the example of Kukov when we always say, uh, we also fall in love if you look at Kukov. We also love nice food. Like, it's a different narrative about Africa that the whole world doesn't even know about. So we're in an age where us as African creatives uh, have the chance uh, to tell and to change the African narrative, the perspective of the whole world. Uh, I remember, uh, uh, so I was, I was fortunate enough to be part of this program that they call the Mandela Washington Fellowship, which is a, a flagship program of President Barack Obama, ex-president, right? And I remember, so the last week of the program, we, you spend it with him. And I remember you, say, you said, okay, everyone take out your phones, uh, Google the word Africa and click on images. And we all did, right? And if you look at the images, it was all up, it was animals, mountains. The only, the only image of a human being that was there was this little kid 
holding like this big yellow container full of water. He's got mucus running all over down. And he said, like, if you look at these images, this is what the world sees. Anyone else in the rest of the world, if they click on Africa, this is what they see. And as far as the, the entire world is concerned, they're concentrating on aiding Africa and not trading with Africa. Because those images are saying Africa needs help. And he said, the only people who are responsible, like I, I remember like my, my hairs like stood up like I had goosebumps. And he's like, the only people who are responsible for changing that image are filmmakers. You guys have a job to change that image. And he even joked around and said, the, the, the America is a superpower. Everyone else in the rest of the world thinks like, if you mess around with America, we'll send Arnold Schwarzenegger and you, 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 you terminate the whole of whatever country that's trying to mess up with America. Because America pushes that whole propaganda with film, right? Which is true and powerful. And this is something that we, it's a challenge to us as creatives, as filmmakers. And that's like one of the biggest things that drew me to Cook Off, like where Cook Off was selling this positive, nice image about Zimbabwe. It's not the typical messages that people are just used to about politics, poverty, and whatnot. So the onus is really on us as filmmakers, as creatives, to change that narrative about Africa to the rest of the world. So you can't blame the rest of the world about how they view at Africa. It's not ignorance. The onus is on us to shift that image, to change it through, through our medium that we can do through film. So, yeah. Thank you for that. And then thank you to everyone for your responses on like what you guys hope to see in African cinema in the future. Um, like with what you've said, Joe, about like how it's up to the people in the continent to like change the perspective of African cinema. Um, I just wanted to ask you and everyone um, what like upcoming projects you guys are working on or thinking of. Um, you can start with, you can start Joe. So, so, so for now, uh, I could say we, we are pretty much still on the cook-off tip. There's still so much work to be done with cook-off. Uh, uh, and after that, uh, we obviously uh, have projects that we're talking about, uh, but that are going within the vision of pushing that positive African narrative to the rest of the world. And for us, like as Zimbabwe, like with, with this whole feat of having Cook-Off on Netflix, which is pretty much a very big deal, right? Like it's history made, but we're seeing it also as the beginning of the future, right? For us to, you know what, to push our stories, to tell our stories, to, to push that positive side about Zimbabwe. It's like, yeah, there could be negative stuff about the politics, about the economics, about the poverty and everything, but there's also the positive. So why not sell that different image about Zimbabwe, about Africa as a whole to the rest of the world? So we, we definitely have uh, upcoming projects that we're working on and that will still keep on pushing that narrative and the vision that we have, that we, we, we did with Cook-Off. Thank you. Um, I, would, I would agree with that. Like there's a, there's a whole lot of stuff um, that we, you know, that we have in, in, in development, that stories that we would like to tell. Um, in particular, though, um, more recently, because I know that uh, Tendi wants to be an action hero and she has a specific interest in futuristic sci-fi, that's, that's where we want, would love to go. But, you know, obviously we still have to think realistically in terms of budgets and stuff. So, but yeah, I, I fully, I fully uh, agree with the idea that we need to help to imagine what the future can be as African storytellers, as African filmmakers, so that we help to inspire the next generation to think even bigger than we are thinking. Thank you. Um, yeah, Tendaisha. <laughs> um, see, as an actress, yes, I'm firstly going to be waiting on Joe and Thomas to finish these films so that I can act in them. <laughs> Um, but other than that, uh, hopefully, um, I'll be working on my own things as well in the near future. Um, I have, um, a newfound desire to be a director. So <laughs> hopefully, and I am a writer already. So, uh, hopefully I'll be working on something, um, a, f a film, hopefully in the next year or two. 
Um, and then also just kind of writing. Um, I'm at the moment working on a play that I'm working on uh, to be shown in Zimbabwe or anywhere else in the world. Um, and then, yeah, just a couple of projects here and there, some friends as well. I, I think it's great to be um, amongst filmmakers and to be amongst creatives because you're always latching onto a project of a friend or, you know, um, coming up with new ideas and trying to implement them. So that's basically what we've been, what we've been busy with now, um, especially during the lockdown and during this pandemic where everything's kind of shut down. Uh, I think it's given us a lot of time to, to, to think, to write and to create. Um, and hopefully once, once everything's back to normal, not that it's ever going to be normal, but like um, <laughs> once it's back again, we can start filming and, and putting some work out there. Okay, so thank you very much. That that was just wonderful. Um, um, Tendaisha, you mentioned Afrofuturism, so I'm I'm sure you're familiar with Wanuri Kaihu's work. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I um, am. I follow her and Nedi. Ne yes, uh, the writer. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay yeah. So <laughs> I like the quote uh, that you said: "Imagining beyond what we really are." That's really what we need to do as African filmmakers. Um, so we're wrapping it up now. Um, the last thing I would just like to ask all of you quickly, because we, we need to wrap up, is just to give us your last final words, any inspirational words to, for future filmmakers. I'll start with you, Joe. Joe, you can go. Okay. Uh, I think uh, for, for filmmakers and creatives, uh, the thing for me is to recognize and see the power we harness as creatives. Uh, whatever images or stories that we're putting out there, it really means a lot and it goes a long way as to what image is portrayed about Africa. It's, 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 it's like a really big job. And I'm so passionate about this, about what image are we putting on the portrayal of Africa? Because that's, that's, that really matters as to how we are seen as Africans all over the world like in as much as we travel uh the picture that's portrayed of us as africans is the picture that we are bringing out as creatives even as filmmakers as reporters and whatnot so i'm just saying to whatever filmmaker when you're making a project or when you're working on whatever film you're doing just think okay this is gonna if this is being seen by by the world what message am i telling what message am i putting out that's my word thomas um, I think my, my final words would be, um, you know, like we overcame a lot of challenges, certainly to, to make cook-off. Um, but at the heart of every story, at the end of the day, are people. Uh, stories are about people falling in love, about relationships with family, about relationships with friends. And you can make that story in, in any setting, in, in any set of circumstances. So, you know, um, we have to position ourselves in, into, into ways where we can tell stories that, you know, have everything that we can imagine uh, and push the boundaries. But in the meantime, you know, don't, 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 don't stop yourself from, from going there and becoming a filmmaker and pushing out content because of, of, you know, waiting for, for money or waiting for resources. We have to start now. You have to improve your craft by starting to make films now with, with what we have, with what you have, with anything to hand. Um, because storytelling is a craft. So we have to get better and better at it and tell better stories. And Aisha? Literally, I was going to say what Thomas just said. Um, I think I'll just encourage it. <laughs> I'll just encourage everybody, um, anyone who's interested in film and in the film industry, to not limit themselves. And like I said, Kogoff is a testament to the fact that anything is possible. And that's been my motto. Um, if you're an, uh, an aspiring actress, cinematographer, whatever it is, even though things are difficult, and I know the arts are usually the first to feel the pinch when there's a crisis or a pandemic, for example. But regardless of all that, 
you know, never to give up and to stay believing in yourself and your calling and your dreams and to push where you can and do the best that you can. Okay, folks, so you heard what Tangaisha said, anything is possible. So on that note, that's a good way um, to wrap up. I want to thank you very much. This is actually our first online event, and I'm glad that we actually got through it. Um, so thank you very much for coming. My name again is, is Mojisola Shinoiki, the founder of the African, Film, the African Film and Arts Foundation. And our next event is next weekend, where we're going to be showing um, the, the film Lara and the Beat. So please tune in for that. It's the first Afrobeat feature-length film out of Nigeria and stars Afrobeat heavyweight Shea Shea, Vector Viper, Tony Tones, and Nollywood stars Uche Jumbo, Samkele Iyama, Wale Ojo, Shafi Belo, Kemi Akindoju, Shahid Balogu, Bimbo Manuela, uh, Bimbo Manuel, sorry, and many more. So you don't want to miss this. So see you then. Thank you for joining us. Please follow us on all social me media platforms at African Film Arts, and our website is africanfilmartsfoundation.org. So thank you very much again for coming. Um, I know it's kind of late your time, so I really appreciate you for tuning in, and thank you for everybody that tuned in today. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.